Lord Jesus, your word, Holy Spirit, where in so many places you have become unnecessary, we welcome you. Come on, you want him to move, bless him. You want him to move, somebody clap, somebody shout. Somebody wave, somebody dance, somebody spin. You may be seated. You may be seated. So good to see all of you. Uh, the Holy Spirit has been dealing uh, with my heart for 40 years. For 40 years I have heard him. Hmm. For 40 years I've believed that the steps of a good man like you do at your local restaurant when you go through the drive through to get your heart attack in a paper sack. I, I have watched him order my steps. Mm. Too many seek a sign when no sign shall be given. But tonight we will discover that signs are following us. This is our finest hour. There has never been a greater church. There has never been a greater move. There has never been a greater baptism. There has never been a greater power loosed upon the earth. There has never been more glory. There have never been more anointings. I submit to you tonight by the scowl on your face. You are looking at me the way Israel looked at Moses. As if. I was speaking about some mocking dream. Too many have preached the funeral of that babe born on Pentecost. Too many have stood graveside and sang sad songs about the demise of that which he breathed his breath into. Tonight, we reject the naysayers. Tonight, now don't get started on me yet. Be see, be see, be, don't get started on me yet. Don't get started on me yet. Now, Say this with me again. We are revenant. And I need to speak plainly. That's odd for me. But I'm going to do my best to talk straight. You love me, don't you? I know you do. I love you too. But I need to talk real straight. Because some of you are confused. You want me to preach, we are relevant. I didn't say relevant. We must be relevant. The issue is, too many folk got no idea what relevant is. They think relevant 
is whether you wear skinny jeans or zoot suit. They think relevant is whether you have purple dye in your hair or green. They think relevant is whether your hair stick up, whether you wear pointed toed shoes with no socks or round toed shoes with polka dot. And none of that has anything to do with relevant. I'll come to that in a minute. So let's start off with revenant. Say it again. Revenant. Now some of you would be, of course, familiar with the 2016. Now all you, all you saints are going to look at me funny now because you want to come up in here and act like you had never been to a movie. I love movies. Look at you. Judging me already. Sitting there with your halo all crooked on your horns. I like movies. I like movies about real men. I'm talking about movies. What? They didn't go to get their pedicure. woman asked me the other day, said, did you get the pedicure? So I pulled off my socks and shoes and showed her. She went, ah! I said, that's right then, but one woman loves my toes and she loves them too. I like movies about real men. Look at some folk getting, getting agitated and irritated at me already. I come pinch your cheek. We become so politically correct in the church that we've forgotten the inner essence of his power. Okay, that went over big. So, Revenant, Revenant. I like that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. When are you ever going to learn that you're never going to agree with everybody? When are you going to learn that and relax? For too long, the church has gotten a little droplet of rain from over the sapphire sill of heaven's gate, and they got a little group around it and started splashing in the puddle and built a fence around it, and anybody that wasn't just like that couldn't get in. I'm going to preach up in here. So I like, I like Leo. Leo, I don't like his politics, but I didn't elect him for anything. I, he won, uh, he won, I ain't going to say that. He won the Best Actor Academy Award last year for a movie called The Revenant. Now, I'm going to act to you like I'm all educated. I do have a doctorate, but I try to forget what they taught me. Listen, I didn't know what Revenant meant. I saw this movie with this cat, and he was wearing a bear, man. That's a man. Then they showed me he was fighting with the bear. My daddy used to say, I'll go bear hunting with a switch. He pulled his pocket knife out and said, That's a man's man. I didn't come up in here to play. I came out of here to drive every devil that even thinks about putting his hand on you. This is still a Holy Ghost church. This is still a Holy Ghost move. This is still a Holy Ghost camp meeting. You get set free up in here. All right, now I got her. So.
Hallelujah. Revenant. So I, I'm not going to be at all educated for you. I had to get on, you know, I had to get on Google. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't find it, so I called his girlfriend, Siri. She said, Siri said, she came back to me. She said, Revenant is one who was assumed dead. But then what showed back up? And I submit to you tonight that the people that have counted you out, the people that said you would never make it, the people that put one foot on religion and the other on academia and declared the demise of the church of Jesus Christ are about to be proven liar. Show somebody and tell them we are revenant. We're not dead. We're about to show back up. And when we do, we're taking it all back. We're taking our town back and our city back. We're taking our churches back and our children back. We're taking our anointing back and our authority back. And we're coming to a city near you. Ain't that right, Brian? I said, ain't that right, Brian? I'll throw you this microphone, make you preach. We are teaming up. We are going to let America know that the church is not only dead, not dead. It has just reached adolescence on its way to adulthood. We're going to plant more churches than McDonald's. Sean, we are revenant. A person who was, you know, supposedly dead. There are Bible revenants. I go all scriptural on you now. There are Bible revenants. Now, see, I can tell by looking at some of you. Some of you would do with a good dose of difficulty. I thought this sanctified bunch over here shouted at that. I, I, some of y'all could do with just a dose of tragedy. Yeah, you could. Some of you, I'm going to prophesy. A bear is coming. Some of you about to lose something. Oh, I know what you want me to do. You ain't never gonna lose nothing. You ain't never gonna have no tragedy. You ain't never gonna see a bear. If you're never going to see a bear, how know you? How you going to know you could eat its liver if you wanted to? There's some devils need killed. Now I need you to, I need you to understand something. I need you to understand. We are coming back. Let me let me break this down for you. I'll do it real quick. Does anybody remember a name, a man named Vince Lombardi? Wave, wave your hand around. Vince Lombardi, he was the uh, legacy, legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers. And in, in 1960, before you were a gleam in your mom and daddy's eyes, in 1960, 
the Green Bay Packers found themselves in the National Football Championship. And they had led the entire game. When suddenly, with a substantial lead in the fourth quarter, the Philadelphia Eagles came back and won the National Football League Championship. It was before Super Bowl. So the next year, Coach Lombardi gathered together the 28-player squad of the Green Bay Packers. All men, all professionals had gone to the very last game of the season and came within a breath of winning. But that breath was too much for Lombardi. Lombardi walked up to that 28 giant men, all professionals, and said, gentlemen, this right here, look at it. In a minute, I'll let you touch it. This gentleman is a football. And they looked at each other. Some scout, some giggled. They said, Coach, what do you mean that's a football? He said, I've decided to spend this entire year trying to teach you the fundamentals of football. Since obviously, you think finesse wins over fundamentals. You think a light show and a preacher that's super powered will fill your building up. You think if you get some Nashville has-beens and some Motown wannabes, you could put some people in a building. You think if you could memorize somebody else's sermon and do their pattern that there'd be a great growth to your church. Let me tell you what it takes to be mm, a, let's see, uh, how about a, uh, what it takes. Pastor Rodriguez, what it takes to be a talker, a motivational speaker, is a sermon. What it takes to be a preacher is an altar and an anointing. What it takes to break the yoke, destroy the burden, loose the captive is beyond you. So here's where we're going to start tonight. We're going to start with this right here. Church, this is a Bible. Right here. Right up in here. If you got one, get on your feet and hold it up. I don't care if you got it on your cell phone. Get it up and wave it around and shout, we're going back to fundamentals, not finesse. Tired of the icing on the cake and nothing inside. BC to 1961, 1961 the very next year, Vince Lombardi led the Green Bay Packers after a year of saying, we are going to pay attention to what everybody else ignores. We're going to pay attention to fundamentals. At the end of that year, they lined up in the National Football Championship against the New York Giants and walked off the field 37 to nothing champions. 
I just think we need to get the church back to the fundamentals. Let's see, how about you must be born again? The problem with the modern church is we have decisions and not conversions. Listen to me. I'm talking about life change. I'm talking about new creature. I'm talking about something that has never existed before that this world nor the devil either one have ever had to deal with. We've been so busy gathering in the net, we forgot to sort the fish. Oh, I like the way you're shouting now. There were Bible revenants. Can you think of one? How about, how about uh, Joseph? Jacob thought he was dead. Just like they think we're dead. <laughs> well, you can't perspire anymore, Pastor Rod, and be a, and be a pastor. You can't, you can't gather a crowd if you raise your voice. And, if you have more than a 45 minute service, they won't come. I had multiple services preachers in 1982. It's not new. Oh, look what we got, multiple services. I preached eight times a week in my church when I was 22 years old. In my 30s and 40s and well into my 50s, I preached five times a week here and 150 nights a year on the road somewhere preaching this gospel. I have been on television to 96% of the world six days a week three times a day for 30 years. Let me help you this way. This ain't my first rodeo. I'm 60 and I can still kick and punch. Ask the devil. I don't care. I don't want to see no more. Hallelujah. If you get tired, God bless you. There's a hotel room somewhere. God didn't give me my voice back to entertain people. That's our problem. We got entertainment, no intercession. Yeah, he's back. Revenant. Show somebody and tell them we're coming back. Now, 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 I'm not talking about relevant. Okay, now don't take exception with me till you know where I'm going. Because I believe in being relevant. We spend an average of $3 million a year in here just updating stuff. In here. Relevant, you got your notepad? Relevant, because I'm gonna take this out of the tape so you can't get it. Relevant is being in contact with the issue. Relevant, look, you can be relevant in a storefront. Do you know the fastest growing churches in America? Do you know what building they're held in? Not a church building. Not an old church building. Preachers all the time, well, I gotta build a new building. Well, I gotta build it. Their building's all over. The devil owns them, move in. Why are you looking at me funny? You don't even know how to shout. 30% of millennials believe the church is completely unnecessary. In my parents' generation, 74% of the people in this country held to Bible-based uh, values, 74%. In my generation, it was 35. 
In my daughter's generation, it's four. From 75 to four in two and a half generations. Why? Because everybody decided to become what they supposed was relevant. Which is Christian speak for, be as close to the world as you can get without going to hell. I'm gonna go over here and say it. Somebody shout up in here now. I was standing on the banks of the river, looking out over life's troubled sea. I saw an old ship, it was sailing. Is that the old ship of Zion I see? Its hull was bent and battered. By the storms of life I could see. But at the stern of that ship was a captain. Yes, sir. Yes, there was. He said, step on board. It's the old ship of Zion. Well. Well, I like, I like things quiet. I like quiet. Worship lights, please. Worship lights. Worship lights. Come on. I'm losing them. Worship lights. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why the church is always looking for a darker place. I don't know why we call these sanctuaries. Sanctuaries where you hide out. I ain't hiding out for nothing. Do you know where the greatest churches of growth, of financial increase, and of winning souls is today? In high school theaters. Look at you. Well, I'd never go. You in a lost world has a hard time coming in here. Because for so long, and I love you, but I got to tell the truth. For so long, the church has been dead Without the good sense, just go somewhere and lay down. It stinks. The people are mean. <laughs> Setting their ways. Well, I don't like, let me explain something to you. You can never have ink put on your body and still be relevant. You can be 16 and relevant, or 60 and relevant, because relevant is not about what you wear. Relevant is to be connected to the issue. Somebody please help this old struggling preacher. Help me understand what is the issue. What is the issue? If you sat 90% of pastors down and said, what is the issue? They'd say, uh, homosexuality, uh, abortion. Uh. Let me explain to you what the issue is. Give me a camera. I need to talk to 100 million people. The issue is twofold. Numero uno. Number one, thou shalt love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And your neighbor as yourself. You want to be relevant? Be like God. God has an issue. I said that phrase one time, and boy, it blew up on Twitter. I can't believe a preacher would say God has an God has an issue. You sitting up in here acting like you don't have one. God. I'll talk to your wife. God has an issue. You want to tell you what it is? He is hopelessly, irreversibly, undeniably, completely in love with you. Now see, you thought, think about all the stuff you did. God, God, God not thinking about what you did. He's thinking about who Jesus is. You're not listening to me. God, his issue is, he loves you in the morning, son. He loves you. I didn't say the person in front of you. I didn't say your pastor. I didn't say the deacon board. I didn't say the prophet. I said he loves you. He loves you in the morning sun. He loves you in the evening rain. He loves you when you get it right. And he loves you more when you mess it up. He, He cannot stop loving you. Now you take that to a hell-bound generation and we will be revenant. The apex of all Christian endeavor must become to place the jewel of a soul in the crown of our Savior. Do you know that over 80% of all the people born again in America this year will be born again in a church that is two years of age or less? Do you know that it takes 100 churches, one entire year, and $100,000 to see one person converted in 12 months. Let me talk to you about the Revenant Church. The Revenant Church will not be characterized by mass evangelism. People love to watch me give altar calls. And God told me two months ago, you be real careful with that. I said, speak on. He said, I'm not moving in just realms of mass evangelism. The new model, the new paradigm is back to the original. What is that? Personal relationship that leads to individual conversion. Stop depending on your pastor that's super powered and your program that's always new to win somebody to Jesus. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints. That's a terrible translation. For the, you ever been to a chiropractor? The adjusting of the saints. What does that mean? Get y'all put together bone to bone, flesh to flesh, 
sinew to sinew, perfect and entire, rising up in every community, in every hamlet, in every city, in every town, the full grown stature of the man of God. Okay. It's a pivotal year. 2017. That, I don't want to go through all of it. 17. The number 7 and the number 10. 1 represents individual perfection or completion. The other represents corporate or ordinal perfection. That means two things. God is about to fix you and complete everything about you so that he can then help you find your purpose in his body so that then the body will be perfect complete and entire and we're about to take this nation by storm. Oh God. So I'm 60. What does that have to do with anything? When I was 27, 1984, I had one of only three open visions that I have had in 40 years. Your neighbor that has three a week <laughs> needs to stay away from the food trucks. <laughs> and all you folks going to heaven and coming back and telling your story, check with Paul. He said, when God took me up there, he told me, don't tell nothing about what you said. You listening to me? So, I'm standing there, and the back wall of that 1,200-seat tabernacle disappeared. A sword appeared. I saw twinkling lights, and as God made me look, I could tell that it was a city skyline. And the twinkling were lights coming out of the buildings. Suddenly a sword appeared, no one holding the sword. Three times it circled. The third time it struck the image of Satan behind his knees. He fell to one side wounded, not dead. And then just as quickly as it had come, it was gone. That's why this looks like this, you understand? To remind me, every time I walk here, that every one of those buildings is full of lost and dying, hurting and bleeding, wounded and frightened, weak and trembling, Souls of God. And just as quickly as the vision came, it left, and God spoke up in my belly. Who is there among you? Brave enough. Strong enough. I'm 27. To pick up that crown and place it on the head of the Savior. And I started screaming. 
I still have the video. I'm brave enough. I'm strong enough. I'm brave enough. I'm strong enough. I'm brave enough. I'm strong enough. I'm brave enough. I'm strong enough to pick up the crown of cities and place them on the head of our Savior. Since I'm 27 years of age, I beg God to tell me what those three swings of that sword were. I've begged him. I even had the Kuhnemans prophesy. Come, lay your hands on me and prophesy. <laughs> Oral Roberts laid his hands on me. Brother Summerall laid his hands on me. Anybody you can think of. And I never was given the revelation of those three swings until I turned 60. And when I turned 60, God took me back in a whirlwind to sitting on his little airplane and Dr. Summerall putting his hand on my knee and saying, I have a word for you. I'll not tell you everything he said, but he did say this. Number one, he said, never be a gospel specialist. Preach all of it. Don't be the healing guy, the prophecy guy, the preach it all. He said, your life will be divided into three stages. Moses was 40 years in Pharaoh's court. Another 40 years on the backside of Midian, tending his father-in-law's sheep. Two swings of the sword. But on the third swing, on the last day of the second phase, God appeared to him in a burning bush that would not be consumed. At that moment, God anointed Moses to become a deliverer of a people born into bondage. And I'd like to break that down for you. Some folk still have an Egypt mentality. Don't shout me down now. On the third swing, God said to Moses, go down, go way down. Uh, Come off your high horse. Quit talking to everybody about your mailing list. And your own family not saved. It'll get better in a minute. Go way down into Egypt's land. Tell Pharaoh. You better let him go. Lifespans are so much shorter now. And as I lay there on my back, after preaching around the world as many as eight times in one year,
God said to me, I'm about to bring you into the third phase. <sighs> Zero to 30, gathering. That's a pretty nice little church building. When I was 29 and built it, it was the largest facility of any church west of the Mississippi River and north of the Mason-Dixon line. It had never been done in the history of this nation. I said, I want to move in there before I'm 30. We started with 17 people. I was called when I was 17 years of age. So was Lester Summerall, so was Oral Roberts, so was T.D. Jakes, and the list goes on. I was 17. Ohio is the 17th state in the union. At our first church meeting, we had 17 people. It's going to be a year. And God saw that vision become a reality. Two and a half miles of pews. I'm 29. I'm about to enter the second phase. The second phase is usefulness, where you take everything you've gathered and you begin to have God's plan and His purpose and His hand placed upon you for usefulness. In my 30s, we moved in here. In my 30s, I went from seven television stations once a week to 14,000 three times a day, six days a week. I built Harvest Preparatory School. God graced us to give birth to Valor Christian College. We birthed the Bridge of Hope Ministries. I could fall down and God would bless it. And I just hit 60. 60! Here's what he told me sitting on that plane. He said, 60, you'll hit your stride and enter the third and final stage of your life. Why do you think Satan put vocal cord cancer in the mouth and throat of a voice piece of the kingdom when I was 59? Stop it. I'm going to stop he saw what was coming when they counted me out when he was clapping his filthy fettered hands together and dancing on the grave he had already dug If you thought you were a preacher before, something's about to happen. There's a shift. There's a change coming. I put you down so I could raise you up. I... Juanita Bynum, I'm getting real personal. I'm sorry. I had 18 pages of notes for tonight. I ain't hit one of them. 
People say, why do you do that? To prepare my spirit. I didn't come to give you three points. That's okay. But I'm on fire right now. I promise you, I put my hand on you right now. Everything you touch in the next three years will be blessed. My hand, come here, come here, my hand, my hand. Ah. Come here, Kevin Wallace. Come here, come here. Where are you? Everything they took, triple, triple. Yeah, we still lay hands on people around here. And I may, lay, I may line you up around this building and lay hands on every sick. Come here, Ronnie. Climb over the pew. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here, Pastor Battle. I've got to give you a good dose lately. Hold hands up. People been talking to you. Stop listening to them. They are drowning out him. Oh. Don't be acting like you didn't get nothing. The third phase of your life is giving. You can be seated. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. Where have all the preachers gone? When did Pentecost become out of fashion? If he was a healer, he is a healer and he will forever be a healer. Your Bible says we know that he has delivered, he does deliver, and he shall yet deliver. Ah, oh God, I'm preaching. There's a new move. Shall Revenant, shall we're coming back? In that movie, he fights that bear because his son, y'all listening to me? His son had been killed. So he starts trekking through rivers, snow waist deep, eating leaves and anything he can get his hands on because he's going to avenge his son. I want you boy preachers and girl preachers to know you call me your daddy, I will track down anything that attempts to put its hand on you. Whoa, somebody just get up and shout them in and I feel them.